Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending uh, the International Trade Council and our part in the summit uh, with Reciprocity ROI. And uh, today we have Paul Claxton, myself, uh, Sanjay Iyer, and Aaron Bishop at Rapaki, who will be uh, speaking on the panel here today. Um, the title of our panel is Perspectives and Experiences on Innovation, and it's important for uh, mankind's future. Moving to the first slide of, of the presentation, uh, just kind of covering our backgrounds here um, at a high level. I'm a serial global entrepreneur uh, and awarded business leader, uh, previous active duty Marine. I have extensive experience working in multiple industries across the globe, from corporate technology to boutique startups and small boutique firms offering services uh, from project management to recruiting, staffing, and uh, various sorts of technology, ERP systems, and so forth. Uh, currently, I, I run a global technology innovation management consulting firm, as well as represent family offices and startups and venture capital firms. Uh, Sanjay is a product board advisor and entrepreneur. He's got an amazing background, seasoned consultant in the product development and innovation space. He's launched products that have served uh, mil over millions, hundreds of millions of subscribers and involving, he has worked in uh, projects involving over 100 million infrastructure up upgrades in the TMT industry, tele telecom, media, and technology. And we also have Erin uh, Bishop Rapaki, who uh, works in robotics. She's a robotics aficionado and angel investor. Uh, she has worked at companies like Industrial Perception Inc., which was actually acquired by Google in 2013. Uh, she currently invests and uh, consults with various robotics and AI startups. Shall we move to the next slide? Just giving opening perspective into what we're going to be discussing today here on this panel. Uh, the opening perspective relates to globalization and the outlook that it carries with uh, technology and the key components as that relates to our overall existence, um, uh, humane existence, uh, and our ch what our chances are for dominance and um, survival at a long-term uh, le level. Uh, global imperatives that we will be discussing include everything from adaptation, ease, access, productivity, social due process, education, equitable distribution. So when we talk about globalization, we're talking about things like the global economy, global policy, global labor markets, global automation, preventing crisis, preventing global crisis, and how technology can play a part in all that and will play a part inevitably now and increasingly will uh, play a, a bigger part as we move towards the future. Uh, some of these imperatives that I've mentioned, such as adaptation, are very key uh, to how we survive now and how uh, the fate of our existence as a global population and is a, um, um, a, a, hu a humane uh, society, so to speak, that is currently developing here on Earth, but also exploring um, spatial uh, participating in spatial exploration as well. And so as it relates to that, there are um, some variables and non-control factors that we as leaders, as technology leaders, and even as individuals participating in day-to-day in, uh, -day society that we all need to be aware of. Some of those non-control factors are things like weather, disease, um, the population boom, human fallacy or human error, uh, and the inevitability of dwindling resources. Some of the controllable factors that we need to be aware of are uh, items um, such as overutilization and underutilization of resources, of Earth's non renewable resources. So, with a growing population, uh, we do need to focus and address uh, matters such as urbanization and resource management. And this will be ever more necessary um, to address these issues, otherwise, we will become uh, extinct. On the opening perspective slide here, I just took a fact from the world's count, uh, the world counts website um, that says 
if we continue at our current rate, the time left till the world runs out of fresh water is just a matter of just under 19 years. So um, some of these non-controllable and controllable factors in terms of utilization rates and resource management are very important uh, to our survivability. Moving on to the next slide. So when we talk about global imperatives, uh, today we're going to be discussing um, adaptation, ease, access, productivity, uh, social due process, equitable distribution, and education. So these are all important, right? Adaptation is a natural process of evolution. We can no longer adapt as fast as we need to without technology, which is why technology from a singularity standpoint is so um you know, it's, it's so prominent in terms of like our lifestyles and how we must think and how we must run our businesses. So we can't continue to live life as we've lived it in the past. Um, ease, automation is the key to quickly decreasing the learning curve that is associated with adaptation. So we can adapt faster if we make this process easier and decrease the learning curve. Accessibility, with no access, ease and the adaptation can never exist delivering tech and education to make them globally accessible, especially to remote lands or underdeveloped nations is one of the big keys here. As an example, cars are no good without roadways. So we must make this technology accessible. Productivity, we, we're, we're a booming society. We're a booming global population. We're doing space, spatial exploration. We have to think of new, new ways to produce and make that, uh, again, accessible. And one of the ways to do that is to focus on uh, building education systems and frameworks around entrepreneurship for global economies so that we can get this technology into the hands of some of the great minds in um, maybe underserved communities or third world countries and help those countries develop because we are all one. It's a one for all, all for one type of um, type of thing going on here. So we all share this world. So we all have to kind of think more at a global uh, partnership level, right? Uh, social due process and equitable distribution. Um, currently, there is tremendous inequality and inequity gap. This is going to be uh, widened with the exposure to technology and the increase around technology as we continue in the future. Um, so we must focus on an inequity gap uh, right now in its more simplistic state, otherwise, is technology begins to immerse, immersify itself into our daily lives and our businesses, it's going to become much, much more complicated and hard to avoid that inequity gap. So there are vital global resources, again, going unused and um, overused and underused. So we must focus on education. Education is our only way forward. It's our only way out of ignorance and naivety. We cannot continue to repeat the past mistakes of our, our history, right? And so education is is one way to avoid repeating uh, previous mistakes of mankind. Uh, moving to the next slide, please. Moving to the next slide, the importance of the imperatives. Thank you. The importance of the imperatives. Uh, the, we as leaders in society, we, we really have to lead, uh, focus on leading the global economy and labor markets with impactful technology and schools of thought to build a secure future. If we can do that and build a secure future and we can implement these into our daily lives and our long-term future goals um, for how we are to evolve you know, as a global population, but also as micro communities or smaller communities at city, state, at city, state, and regional level, then what the result is, is that we'll have more of it an advanced society, or what I like to call a super society, where we can all live longer and greater lives of sustenance. So let's talk about this further, please, as it relates to productivity. Uh, and I'm gonna bring Sanjay in to uh, give his thoughts on the matter. Next slide, please. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. That was a pretty good list of global imperatives that you have there. And I want to touch on productivity, which has been a theme for well over a couple of decades uh, in the US. Um, 
it's been a game changer for corporate success in Americas. Um, basically, if you look at the revenue growth of all the big name companies past two decades, it's been growing, but what's dramatically growing is the profitability of those companies. And that's pretty much attributed to productivity. Uh, it's basically doing more with less and it's continuously evolving. And there are three flavors that we are seeing, we have seen in the past and we'll continue to see in the future. And that is doing more with less manpower. And that relates to automation of business operations uh, in anything that a business does that can be done better with automation with fewer people and doing more with less capital. You've seen that with offshoring, particularly in the manufacturing industry uh, and doing more with less time. It, it, this is about how businesses have simplified their operations. Anything that looks complex is broken down to much simpler components and done better in you know in a fast way so that that's basically what productivity has been in the past and will continue to evolve uh, in different ways and i want to remind about one famous tagline that there is no business that cannot be improved that was famous tagline of a major consulting company a couple of decades ago and i believe it is still very true uh, next slide please So the key aspect of productivity is automation and it's been the holy grail. So there are two main movements uh, that we wanna talk about. One is business process automation with software bots. And what I mean by that is imagine any process in a business organization, it used to be manual 20 years ago and then apps came along and it turned into automated or semi-automated but it was multi-touch screens and it evolved over time so what it took like 10 people to do a process now it takes one person with a single touch to accomplish that and where it's evolving now is towards a zero touch operation so everything is done behind the scenes with software bot and that's where i think the power of productivity comes through when we have a distributed bots performing the work of many human beings uh, in experienced human beings too. So that's gonna be a huge lift in productivity when we get there, right? And the second movement is human intelligence replaced by machine intelligence. And you have heard of AI, you know, probably a lot. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do, but basically it's replacing subject matter experts with machines that can become experts in some cases where the experts teach the machines and in other cases where machines learn by themselves these are pretty sophisticated technologies that have been around the corner for a long time but it's going to be mainstream soon with these in mind if you were operating a business today uh, there are two questions you might want to ask yourself and understand where you are in this journey one question is, can you operate your business with half your workforce? And the other question is, with half your workforce, can you also handle twice your customer base? More orders, more production, right? And if you think hard and cold uh, and strategically, the answer would be probably yes in both of these cases. And that's where the opportunity lies for most of the global corporations to operate at a much level, higher level of productivity. Next slide, please. Now, that's one important movement, but I wanna introduce the concept of productivity squared. What it is, is uh, basically the technologies that propel productivity in your organization are themselves being produced at an astonishingly faster pace. So basically you're getting a multiplier effect in the way the products are being released to the market and how enterprises and corporations use that to improve their own productivity, right? The three big movements here when it comes to product development that I wanna to touch on. And one is 
the basic belief that change is a constant. So you see frameworks like Agile, DevOps, CI, CD, when it comes to um, you know, product development, and these are pretty massive changes from the old way of doing things, and that's resulted in much faster product releases. The movement number two is don't reinvent the wheel. So what this means is, when you're developing products, you choose an ecosystem from some of the big names like Apple or Android, Google, uh, Amazon, Microsoft. And once you plug into the ecosystem, you keep the benefits of a lot of the products and you know middleware and software that's already produced for you and you just build on top of that without reinventing the wheel. What that means is you don't have to waste a lot of time on doing things that are not necessary anymore, right? And that's a pretty big, you know, trend from the past decade or so, right? And then movement number three is codeless. And this is relatively new. So there were times when it took a lot of developers writing a lot of length of code to release a product. In today's world, you don't have to write code. The machines generate the code. And there are many examples in the market that you would see products that will help you build a website or build a SaaS servers in the cloud without writing code, and it's pretty amazing. Uh, an, an example is Instagram, very popular social media app that was created a decade ago. Uh, it can be launched if, from scratch if you were to start today at a fraction of its cost in about in less than two or three months. And that's how far we have moved in, in the software development lifecycle, right? So with, with these three movements in, in mind, uh, the big question is, can you bring a new idea to market in less than three months? And the answer could be yes. Uh, if it's a software-related or service-related product, I think it's very much possible to do things much faster uh, uh, and easier than before. Next slide, please. With, with that, I would leave it to Erin to talk about a few more things. And then we'll conclude at the end. Thanks. Yes, uh, I certainly have a few thoughts. Um, I always like to kind of backtrack a little bit in the conversation about productivity and the imperatives. Uh, I think of this when I think of a conversation with my grandmother. Uh, you know, in 1950, there were 2.5 billion people in the world, and now there is 7.8. So, so we've three xed and. I, it's important to think about this context because where I come from, which is the world of robotics and automation, uh, there's that frequent headline saying robots are going to take your jobs. And there's a number that is always missing, which is the total, which is the increase in demand for goods and services. I'll illustrate it this way. So not only am I talking to people who, um, tend to forget that the global population has 3 x in the past 50, uh, well, 70 years. Um, we can assume that the demand for goods and services are 3 x So we can say that whatever production and productivity metrics that we were leveraging in the 50s and 60s just need to be 3 x more productive. But actually, due to the increase in wealth, uh, people are demanding so many more goods and services that the workforce cannot keep up to meet the demands. Uh, to illustrate, for example, let's say there's a product, um, let's call it, uh, uh, um, there's a product that's in demand by 10,000 people. I'm gonna use like maybe avocados, just like you need 100 people to farm the avocados, um, to pick them, you need enough fields, and that's for a market of 10,000 people. Uh, but now what's happening is these, these market demands are, are 100xing. Um, like, let's say 1 million people now want avocados. You don't just do things the same way and 100x your workforce the same way. And this is how I want to illustrate the workforce strain and the labor shortage strain that we're seeing. So regarding uh, many of these different imperatives, what I am actually concerned about is labor shortage. I'm concerned about things not being produced in time. I'm concerned about waste. I'm concerned about uh, logistics, things actually not moving to the right time at the right place. Um, 
regarding ease, uh, another another thought. This may, um, regarding labor shortage is also the skills gap. Uh, people aren't trained to do the jobs of the future. Well, let's assume that there is a manual labor shortage, which which is happening. Uh, people need a livable wage. However, uh, with a manual labor shortage, the people who can work these farms are actually going to be tool operators and equipment operators or robot operators. So that necessary upskilling is very important. And we see that in STEM education today. Uh, but actually, I would say not only STEM education is important to the future, uh, actually, it's mental health and introducing mental health services and even mental and even education in basic psychiatry uh, very at, at earlier ages, because the workforce of the future needs to have self-esteem, needs to be able to work through problems and communicate, needs to be open to ideas. And frankly, the workforce of the future, they need to be project managers. And it's very difficult to do that without a foundation of, of mental health, of, of uh, being able to reason. Uh, and so it's not necessarily that education that we need to teach science, but we do need to teach the scientific method in order to problem solve. And that is actually what's going to help us create a workforce that can actually operate these tools and problem solve and project manage uh, this new way of production. And that new method of production is absolutely required because we can't just find more bodies to throw at the job. And that's what COVID really made people realize that we can't just throw more bodies at the job anymore. We can't find the bodies, can't pay the bodies. And, the, and if we put too many bodies in a single place, they're going to get sick. So when I look at uh, extrapolating forward, regarding production, productivity, manufacturing. I'm seeing that the globalization dynamic is actually shifting. I see that uh, globalization for the past 50 years has just been chasing down the low cost labor pool for manual labor, but that metric is gonna have a stopping point. And we're seeing that China's opening up factories in Africa. Africa is the last continent available to exploit for low cost la labor. But after that, the good news for the species will be more people are wealthy and more people demand labor rights. Let's hope that happens sooner than later. So. If we have a globe where there's no more reduced labor pools to exploit, there's an increased demand for goods and services, there's an increase in wealth. And by the way, we can't just throw more bodies at the job because there's a manual labor shortage. And uh, with carbon offsets, maybe we don't want to move things, um, the carbon production uh, emissions, we don't want to just redundantly move things around the world to lower cost labor pools. There's going to be a tension building on how things get made affordably. And what's going to ease that tension is robotics and automation. And maybe maybe um, uh, Paul and Sanjay, if you can chime in again, we can enter a discussion that uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunity coming forward in the future to solve these problems uh, regarding the in increase in demand and the... the um, uh, and the constraints of, of climate change. Yeah, I, I agree, Aaron. Um, and, and in terms of, you know, what the future looks like and, and you know, achieving some of these very same things that you talked about, you know, uh, the sustainable uh, development goals, um, you know, ESGs or environmental sustainable goals and so forth. Um, it's going to be very important that we focus more, that we begin to focus more as a society on, on individual welfare, right? Um, you know, as a society, we depend on technology more and our relationship begins to evolve with technology. We're going to need to focus more on how we interact with each other as humans um, and how we use technology. Uh, that's going to be very important. And one thing that you brought up was taking jobs, robots taking jobs. You know, I mean, you have robots that will eventually be in homes. Oh, well, we already have robots in homes. Alexa, you know, is an example. But those robots will take human form. And those robots will begin taking more than just our jobs. They'll be begin taking our, our personal relationships. And so those are things that we need to think about. So when we think about productivity and leading back 
to Sanjay here, um, you know, as we kind of wrap up the panel, um, when we talk about productivity, it's, it's less about what we're producing, but it's more about why we're producing it, focusing on why, in my opinion. Uh, Sanjay, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think what, why, and how, they're all related <laughs> in my mind. So there's a question around what you're producing and why you're producing that I think Aaron addresses very well. And then how you produce it is the productivity component of it. And I think putting it all together in, in, in a nutshell is every global producer or player would need to rethink about what, why, and how in the coming uh, decade, in my mind. Yeah, I have to agree. I'd also like to add, though, um, um, when we do I'm think sorry, about, oh, yeah, uh, regarding person-to-person -person interaction and jobs, you know, I think a great leap for society is not to measure society based on jobs. And there's this wonderful book called The Four Futures, which outlines uh, four different types of outcomes for how we arrange our society. It's either communism, socialism, rentism, or extremism. And I don't want to be an extremist. Uh, I got very unsettled when I watched that movie Elysium, where basically the if there are no jobs for uh uh, lower class people, then, then should those people exist? What I foresee is actually a different type of balancing act. Right now, we've created a society in America where you need two incomes or more um, in order to sustain a household. And I think there are a lot of people who had the option in the past uh, to choose human to human caregiving. I don't think robots are going to replace human connections. I think a lot of people are using digital media, VR, video games, and movies to replace human connection. And in some respects, that's a choice or that's a cultural uh, phenomenon that, you know, it's less than ideal. But I think if families, if, if a parent could afford to stay home to take care of their kids and be with their kids, if people could afford to take care of the grandparents, if people actually wanted to live with family members and actually take care of each other, I don't, there's, there's an unlimited possibility for human, human caregiving and individual caregiving from others, such as teaching and volunteering. But right, the issue right now in society is that's not affordable. People need jobs to afford their, afford a home. <laughs> and I want to believe that if we stop anchoring societal metrics on jobs, instead anchor societal metrics on um, happiness or sustainability or purpose. I think a lot of people would choose to find a purpose um, that actually brings them closer to others. But right now we mandate that everyone have jobs instead. Yeah, I, I would definitely have to agree. Um, you know, and I, I, I don't think that, you know, again, back to my previous comment, I, I don't think that robots are going to take our jobs or necessarily our, our personal relationships. Robots only have the power that we give them. And that's that's right. why you know, the, the personal aspect of things is so very important in terms of like how we utilize them and, and why, once again, why. But then once circling back to uh, Sanjay, you know, what are we producing? You know, um, so I think those things are key. Um, you know, I mean, they have, uh, robots that can befriend your kids or potentially be a partner, like a spousal partner to you, you know? So when you look at relationships, um, ultimately it is the personal relationships that drive our decisions with technology. So we'll never get away from that. But, um, I, I think those are definitely key, you know, moving forward to our future. But I do think that we need to learn how to live with robots and learn how to better live with technology and then we can also better learn to live with each other. Absolutely. Very true. I would like to add that there are certain roles that machines cannot fulfill and that's the creative process. You cannot teach a robot how to think like a human and be creative or emote, for example, right? So uh, I think the workforce would be more and more towards of these conceptual, creative, more of the organizational aspects of a business, whereas the mundane routine jobs would move to 
bots and robots, right? And that will be kind of a happy medium, I think. But that would mean a lot of a different focus on education uh, in the next decade where people are learning besides STEM skills, you know, how to think bigger uh, in being broader than actually, actually focus on narrow task-based execution. So there's a lot of room for robots and humans to, I guess, live together. But the way we think about work, or the workforce of the future could look very different than what it is now. How, how do you think COVID plays a part in all of this? Um, you know, as it relates to robots and, you know, having, having less, a, a lower touch, uh, what I would call a low touch society. What, how, how do you think that relates to COVID and where we're headed? Because, you know, the way that we all look at the world differently is changing because of COVID. Right. I think, I think uh, that's a good point. I think uh, we're going towards a new normal where the old normal may not make a lot of sense uh, or the way we used to think about work. So uh, one of the big pluses pre-COVID was having that collegial camaraderie of being in an office with people and interacting with them outside of work. So that was a good thing. But now people have learned to distance themselves. So becoming more and more of a machine oriented, I guess, uh, work execution mode, you know, minus, minus all the good part of being in an office and meet, meeting people, right? Um, so I don't know, the new normal post COVID could look very different than the old normal. And it's, it's hard to say, you know, um, if, would people go back to the way it was? completely or would things change forever? Mm. I'm quite, uh, it, so I used to sell telepresence robots. So uh, for two or three years, I was very much advocating remote work. And what COVID has allowed, it's finally uh, put everyone in the same playing field about uh, using video conferencing, remote teams, Many more companies have that skill set across all generations, whereas before maybe one generation favored it over another. There's certain material, hardware, machine-based jobs and logistics jobs that cannot be done remotely. But there are a lot of workforce jobs where people can have options on where they live. Uh, I was reading a statistic that um, we are the least mobile generation, not only due to real estate prices, is it hard to get up and move to a more thriving city or urban area with more jobs? Um, just people are not choosing to move. And I think we see this in our politics, but what can happen is, uh, certain regions with internet access that, that might not have had the factory next door or might not have the big tech company next door. Uh, people have a lot more choice to live where they want to live. And, and that will impact, um, uh, kind of local, uh, local politics, uh, and, and give people freedom. Um, to, to also keep the home that they want, even if it's not near any industrial setting and possibly do have a meaningful career uh, online. So co I'm very grateful COVID has leveled the playing field in that regard. That is true. And also to touch on productivity, I, I think COVID has uh, made it a lot more productive to work from home when you, know, you take out the commute and the amount of time you spend in front of the screens you know, from the beginning of the day to the end of the day, I think it's been a huge change for a lot of people. So that's about COVID, I guess. Uh, well, um, robots and COVID, I think there are a lot of opportunities for disinfecting robots to do some of the work that humans would typically do when in the decontamination process, and there could be a lot of opportunities there in the short term, uh, and that may evolve to more longer term solutions using your bots inside the office buildings. Agreed, agreed. Yeah, it's it's very interesting, um, you know, where we're headed, and you know, that's I think that's that's why we chose to speak here um, because. 
you know, we do touch so many, all of us, uh, both me, Sanjay and Aaron, all three of us, we, we do touch so many areas in technology um, and working with government level type of organizations, but all the way down to the smaller firms. Um, but we do see the big picture um, and we do want to pay that knowledge forward and, and our experiences and, you know, what we're seeing out in the market is we kind of keep our ear, you know, we keep our ear to the microphone and our eyes, you know, uh, kind of 360. So, you know, if anyone has any questions or uh, would like to talk with us, you know, please do feel free to interact with us in our virtual booth. Uh, we'll be here here at the uh, summit, and um, or you can also contact us uh, on the uh, the contact page of our presentation there, which is currently showing. So uh, you can just contact me directly, and if you'd like to speak with Aaron or, or Sanjay, I can certainly refer you. Thank you.